Right, we're live. So, um, hello everybody. Tonight we're joined by Nikki Flunder, who is in Canada. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for making the time to talk to us, because I know you're a very busy lady. Absolutely. <laughs> so, do you want to... Everywhere here. <laughs> do you want to start off by introducing yourself and telling us a bit about yourself and how you got involved with horses? I know that's a very long lot to talk about, but <laughs> start from the beginning. Um, yeah, so I'm Nikki Flendra. Um, and I grew up across the road from my grandpa's farm. He had horses, um, you know, the whole time I was a little girl and I, I was that horse crazy little girl from just the time I was, um, you know, itty bitty. I always loved horses. And so I guess I just, I went over to my grandpa's every chance that I got and just fell more and more in love with horses. And by the time I was 12, I um, had talked my mom and dad into letting me buy a little mare. Her name was Diamond. And I took a um, I took some odd jobs to pay the lady I bought her from $100 every month for a year. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so my first horse of my own. Um, my grandpa had always been sweet enough to let me ride and um, play with his horses as much as I kind of wanted to. But um, so I started Horse 4-H with her and I went on to do high school rodeo with her and um, we roped and we ran barrels and did ran poles and goat tied and did all that stuff and then I went on to trick ride on her too actually and then um kind of the rest was history I just I I loved rodeoing and trick riding and and um yeah it just kind of went on from there so you are very accomplished there is a very long list of things that you've achieved when I read your biography <laughs> so anybody who's listening in the UK could you tell us some of your accomplishments just to give us an idea about sort of what you've done uh, well, I've been really, really fortunate in my career and I've been really blessed to um, spend most of my life um, making a living with my horses. So I have got to work a lot of um, a lot of the major rodeos in North America. Um, the National Finals Rodeo was always a really big goal of mine from the time I started trick riding and I. Um, I worked that roadie, I think, seven times. Um, and that was just like the first time I ever rode there was like a dream come true. I kind of felt like that was the moment when I was like, oh man, I'm really doing this. Like, you know, I've made it. I felt like I finally made it at that point. Um, and yeah, so lots of big rodeos, um, Cheyenne and Houston and Fort Worth and Reno and like just all the ones that I ever dreamed about. The Calgary Stampede was a huge dream come true for me. Um, and then all of that kind of led into doing stunts in the movies and um, doing um, different things, specialty work with my horses in the movies. And I started out just because of my trick riding background, getting into the stunt work. And um, my dad worked in the film industry doing special effects. And I worked for his company for a lot of years, learning how to do pyrotechnics and, and really being involved in the film industry and stuff. So I got to do all kinds of fun things with um, my dad's company. We blew up houses on the movies and did bullets and did, I mean, some really pretty incredible things and and it was just all kind of a natural progression I got into the stunt work and the um horse training side of the film industry and that's what I really loved and have pursued since then so lots of tv shows and stunt work and rodeos and just been really lucky to have a pretty pretty fun career <laughs> amazing so tell us about trick riding then if people might not know what trick riding is sort of over here and how how did you get involved in that what was the motivation um well I, my dad had taken my sisters and I to the Calgary Stampede um from the time I was a little girl and I used to watch the trick riders they would fly mm -hmm. around the arena and do all kinds of amazing tricks and gymnast it's basically gymnastics on a really fast running horse mm -hmm. and I just, I was mem mesmerized. I remember being a little girl just peeking through the fence and thinking one day I'm going to, I got to do that. Mm. And um, 
so I started taking lessons when I was 15 years old from uh, Jennifer Hay, who was very accomplished, uh, you know, one of the best. And she was a family friend and started taking lessons and, and really, really started to pursue it after high school and get serious about it. So. Amazing. Yeah. So you said that led on to getting involved in TV and film. So can you tell us a little bit more about that then? How did that sort of come about? Um, well, my very first, um, my very first stunt job was actually when I was 15 years old and I had, I just started taking these trick writing lessons and doing a little bit of that. And the stunt coordinator at the time knew Jennifer and myself and kind of knew what I was doing with the stunt writing. And somehow I think that's what um, that's the reason why he called me, but I did a, it was actually a stunt for the movie, honey, I shrunk the kids and <laughs> it was nothing to do with horses, but I had to do, take a pretty hard fall. And, um, and I remember getting my very first stunt check and it was for quite a bit of money for a 15 year old. And I thought, well, I really need to do a lot more of these. That was pretty yeah. easy. <laughs> so, um, so I did, I just, um, you know, I got put my resume together and I did, you know, I tried to go train with, with some really good people and learn how to do the horse drags and falls. And, um, I've done some high falls and I've done some, some fight scenes and I've done a lots of horse, lots of horse riding and falls. And, and now of course that I'm a little older, I'm starting to pay for a little bit. Of that. <laughs> I don't, I don't do much of the dangerous stuff anymore since I've had but it's it was really fun. It taught me a lot, and it was fun. I can't imagine what is it like being dragged from a horse. Hopefully, I never have to experience that. Uh, it's thrilling. Um, you know, it's different for the movies. There's breakaway um, ropes and things that you can pull to come free, and um, so really, it's it's not as bad as it seems. But a lot of them were pretty good stunts, and. Um, yeah, I don't think I would have the courage to do now what I used to do. I look back and go, I really cannot believe I did all those things. <laughs> so what was your most daring stunt then, do you think? Um, I think probably drag was the thing that scared me the most, was having my foot kind of basically tied into the stirrup and then dr dragging along beside the horse going flat out across, you know, totally open land was um, pretty... That was probably the hardest stunt. It's me. It's so tell us a bit more about the pyrotechnics then. So that's that's quite another string to your bow. <laughs> Not yeah. many people can say that. Um, I give my dad all the credit for that. Um, he has been involved in the pyrotechnic industry for years and years. Um, he started out in the explosives business and just kind of decided, uh, same thing. He started, um, there was a movie being filmed by our house and he went to kind of check it out and see what it was all about and, and decided that he wanted to pursue the film industry and the special effects in it. And, and as I kind of watched him progress through that, I really took an interest to it and I loved working with him. I loved, um, you know, learning how to blow things up with him. <laughs> Just create, we used to make it rain. We would make fog. We um, came up with some crazy stunts. He flew me off of um, the ice at the world figure skating championship. I used to do a lot of competitive figure skating when I was a teenager. And, um, so he was doing the special effects for the world figure skating championships. And he decided to fly me off the ice with sparks coming out of my skates. And it was really <laughs> something that, I mean, not, not many people, I mean, it was 24 years ago. So not, you know, a lot of people had done a lot of aerial, um, gigs in live shows at that point. And so it was really kind of groundbreaking entertainment and I loved it. I loved flying. We ended up doing it, that stunt several times, flying off a horse. And, um, and then we decided, well, why stop there? Why not put sparks, you know, when I'm standing on a horse coming out of our, out of my flag and why not leave a trail of fire on the ground when I do a suicide drag off my horse? And we just tried all kinds of crazy stuff. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it went terribly wrong, but uh, we remember the times that it worked. <laughs> right. Now I understand why you're such a daredevil. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my dad is, my dad 
I got all that from my dad. My mom just shakes her head and, and worries a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like that with my children. <laughs> oh, funny. So, um, well, this brings me nicely into my next question. What is your relationship with fear? Sounds like you don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I do now. Yeah. Um, oh gosh. I think, um, I think I look at fear. Well, really, I, I don't know. That's a hard one for me. I am a lot more, less courageous, let's say now than when I was young. I really, I never even thought about fear when I was younger. I, I just wasn't, I didn't worry about it. I will say over the years, I have really learned to trust my intuition and I really follow my intuition strongly now in everything I do. And I think I always have. Um, and I try to take the path that feels good to me and know the difference between, um, having fear of something because of the unknown or because of it taking you out of your comfort zone and learning how to un overcome that or having fear because it doesn't feel right. Yeah. And if it doesn't feel right, or if it feels too dangerous, um, then I'm not willing to do it anymore. And I really, really use those guidelines to, to, you know, show me which direction I want to go with my life. And, and sometimes I do make decisions, you know, just based on my gut instinct that might not be, you know, the logical or the, the thing that would look to be the most logical way, but it, it has a funny way of working out. And, um, I try to stretch my comfort zone and do things that I'm a little bit afraid of as long as it's not, um, really dangerous to my physical well anymore so I guess I don't know what kind of relationship that means I I, I try not to live my mm -hmm. life here to do anything but I do try to be a little smarter about things now <laughs> I think it's really important isn't it to be able to distinguish between that intuition yeah. like the, I shouldn't be doing this because there is a genuine reason to be scared versus yeah. like oh I'm just not sure yeah. I think sometimes that gets beat, beaten out of us because we get oh. pushed into it because we oh. think oh I should get on today you know everybody's expecting me to get on today so you get on and something happens but you think I knew I shouldn't have got on today and then eventually you lose that intuition because it becomes so blurred and you don't trust yourself anymore such a good point Louise and I think with horses that is the most important thing that we have is our intuition and if something doesn't feel right you need to trust that and if um, if you feel like things are going well and you can push it a little more then you need to do that. That's how we grow. That's how we get better. Yeah. Um, and nobody else can define that for you. You have to really, um, trust yourself and trust your feelings towards things. And, and, and that's how those feelings grow too, is when you, when you use them to kind of guide your path, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. I was listening to you on another podcast when I was doing my research um, and you were talking about the accident you had. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that? Oh, yeah, yeah. which one? <laughs> oh, no, goodness, is the mall. <laughs> you, um, yes, the main one. I'm sure you're talking about the main one. Um, yeah. When I was um, 20 years old, I think I was 20 years old, um, I was just leading a couple of horses at an arena that I was boarding my horses at. They were two brand new prospects that I was going to train to be trick riding horses. And a dog had come around the corner and one of them kind of started to pull back and spook a bit. And I just turned to look and see what the problem was. And the dog kind of came at the horse and it, and it kind of lunged and reared forward and, and got me in the face and um, knocked me down and kind of danced on top of me and got kind of tangled up and it was just it all happened so fast and I didn't I didn't know that horse at all but it was obviously just a really um spooky worried horse that was you know I just I'd never been around a horse that wasn't afraid to to strike out or or hit somebody or um dance all over somebody I just never just never even occurred to me that that could happen um but it really didn't make me more fearful um all i remember it never did knock me unconscious um eventually my farrier showed up about 45 minutes later and found me kind of wandering around i didn't really know where i was but um and i had a lot of a lot of uh damage to my chin and my jaw and i had about over 200 stitches in my tongue and my face and my chin and five plates in my face and 
and I was looked pretty messy for a while, but I had a very good plastic surgeon and he kind of, um, put things back together. And, um, and I just remember healing up and being, having my jaw wired shut. And all I could think of was I can't get back to riding fast enough. Like I still tried to practice and, and there were certain things that, um, I couldn't do cause I had some separated ribs and stuff, but I, it never occurred to me to change my direction or be scared of horses or be like, it just, all I could think of was I got to get back at it as fast as I can. And why do you think that was? Why do you think that you uh, reacted to it in that way? Whereas some people maybe would have been terrified and never, do you, you think know, that with your upbringing or in the way that you'd been daredeviled around? <laughs> It just, it honestly never occurred to me to be scared. Even after that, I just, um, I, I don't know why. I think it just, it's not in my, and I don't know why then, because now, I, like I said, I really have changed, especially since I've had kids. I, I really, I do have legitimate, you know, worries and fears with yeah. riding things. And I do not do the things that I used to just do without giving a thought in the world and I and I have had a lot of you know training wrecks learning to trick ride and different you know accidents here or there and broken bones and this and that but it just I think probably what it comes down to is I loved it and wanted it more than I was ever afraid of it and it just didn't it wasn't like I had huge fears to overcome or I just my mind was so set on mm -hmm. on things I wanted to to get done that it just didn't even it didn't didn't give me worry to slow down and think oh this is too scary you know amazing so how did you get introduced to liberty training then um well that's easy I went to Australia um in 2007 and did a show called spirit of the horse mm -hmm. and, and we went over two weeks early to trick to train the trick riding horses for the show and i went to trick ride in the show mm -hmm. and i had the opportunity to meet um <laughs> hi shade <laughs> we have a little peekaboo <laughs> um so i I watched, I, I met Dan James and watched his work and I just was absolutely fascinated with um, everything that he was doing. And it was kind of like that moment I had at the Calgary Stampede watching the trick riders. And I was like, okay, well now I need to do that. <laughs> Such a beautiful timing and beautiful thing to come into my life at that time. Um, Cause I knew I didn't want to trick ride forever. And I also knew that I really wanted to, um, still base my career around horses and everything that I was doing. So, um, I kept in touch with Dan and I brought him over, um, a couple of years later and kind of did an internship with him and, um, learned so much. And it was just a natural kind of transition from trick riding. I kind of did a little bit of both for a while. And then, um, once we had our first little boy, then I just kind of mostly stuck to the Liberty work. So, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> so, um, and then obviously, then you use that with in your film and TV work. So, yeah. yeah. So, how do you prepare your horses then for that kind of thing? Uh, well, at first, it really just kind of seemed to go hand in hand. A lot of the jobs that I did were things uh, for Heartland and some of the movies. They needed lay down horses or rearing horses, um, things that. Um, my horses were, I'd already trained them um, with the help of Dan to do for my show. And then, um, you know, then once my name got out there and, and that I could do a little bit of these different things with the horses, then I started having to figure out how to train for specific jobs that they wanted. So maybe they wanted a fight scene with the horses or they wanted one horse to circle another horse standing still, or they want, you know, just depending on whatever crazy random thing they wanted. I, I always thought it was fun to try to figure out how to train that and get it done. So it, it's been really an interesting film work is easier than live shows in some regards because you don't have the pressure of the live where there's no no chance whatsoever to do it over. But with the film work, there comes a whole nother kind of pressure that's like um, really intense. It's really 
um, if it doesn't go just as they want it, there's no just smile and pretend like it's part of the show. Like you have to deliver what you've said that you will or what they want. And that's a lot of pressure. It can be, you know, it can be a lot. We know how horses are. They can be pretty humbling at times. So um, mm -hmm. I've been really lucky to have really solid horses that have been, um, they made me proud lots of times. So. Mm -hmm. So what's yeah. the most complex thing you've um, you've trained for a TV show or a film? Um, there's been a few different scenes that have been really difficult. Um, probably a couple, I would say, well, the always the hardest thing is when they want to go in the wide open in the middle of nowhere on grass with horses <laughs> and they don't want them to eat. So you have to kind of work through that make sure they're good and full and happy and 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 then they you know they want everything wide open which is always a huge temptation for the horses mm -hmm. so that's always the biggest challenge and then um probably some of the fight scenes we've done for heartland um where there will be like horses milling and my horses had to like take a certain path running through them and then uh, my other horse would have to be on a mark and he would be, you know, moving around him and coming at him. And then, uh, and then I'd have to take the mark away and move the other horse towards, you know, just, just creating these scenes that is like really hard to make look like, um, to make look natural and have it all set up so the horses go exactly where the camera wants them to be at exactly the right time and i can't be in the shot so i have to figure out how to cue them from a ways away to do it and um yeah that that and i went to vancouver to do a show called zoo one time and i took four horses and trained two two of our ranch horses to do some of the work they want and they had to run um through marketplaces and swarm yeah. around girl in a circle like they were attacking her and do all these crazy things that were just like really hard to train it was a little bit crazy so that must take some planning to break it all down into chunks and then put it all back together yes so much planning and then the funny thing about um the film industry is you do all that and you plan it all and you work so hard to practice it and then you get there and then they change their mind so oh, no. that's the <laughs> That's the kind of frustrating thing where you get there and then they decide, oh, I think we'll do it a different way or we'll do something else. And and then you kind of have to go, oh, gosh, well, how can I get that done now? And sometimes you just have to be firm and say, like, look, no, this is what they're capable of or this is what we've prepared for. And other times you have to just be able to kind of, if you think you can pull it off, roll with the punches and try to be, you know, work with them as best you can. So it's a real balancing act with the movies and the live shows and then not wrecking the horses for the live shows by doing some of the crazy movie things that they, you know, and some of that movie stuff does untrain um, some of the things you've worked really hard for, for the live shows, it kind of falls apart because they want to do it several times and you can't really correct or, you know, as you're going, like it's all just such a rush and they want it so many times. And so you really have to always keep the best interest of your horses in mind and try to, you know, give them the best that you and your horses can, but also not at the expense of, you know, your horse's best interest. So it's all just a... It's a really fine line all the time. So I have to ask you this, right? So we're, we're very lucky. Well, I say lucky because of COVID. We're not lucky because of COVID, but it's presented unique opportunities. So with the International Liberty Horse Association, we've been able to compete here in the UK virtually. So we do our little pattern and we film it and we send it in. Yeah. So you can practice and it all goes wonderfully. But then as soon as your husband appears with a video camera, and it all goes to parts. And then when you say, when you've done it for like the fifth time over and you're nearly ending up getting divorced, you know. <laughs> so, so clearly, like, how, how do you prepare mentally for um, doing the TV work? Because I imagine it's a, a similar scenario in that you, ha you have to get it right within a couple of takes. Can you yeah. give us any tips for when we're doing our, um, doing our little patterns? <laughs> yeah. I think, well, the number one thing is when you're practicing, try to set everything up um, exactly how it would be 
on the day you're going to film or in the situation you're going to film. Prepare your horse in every single way that you can um, to what that day is going to look like. And then the other thing and something that Dan always taught me is always ask your horses more um, in the practice pen and when you're working them and working with them so that the show things or when you're taping are the easy things. So for example, if I'm going to do a part in the show where I would lay my horse down and, and circle horses in two different directions around him while he lays down. While I'm practicing, I would ask him to lay down and stay and hold that for ages. Then I will bring the horses and circle them around for twice as long as I would in a show. And so that when we get to the show and he lays down and they do a couple of times, it's just so easy for them because they're used to so much more than that. And I think you have to have that mentality with Liberty training. You have to ask so much more and be prepared for so much more than what you're hoping to deliver at the important days, you know. Okay, brilliant. I'll bear that in mind next time <laughs> when I'm getting tired to that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you mentioned that um, you worked on Heartland. Um, what was the best bit about working on Heartland? Everybody loves Heartland. Uh, well, it has been a real, real blessing for me um, because it's been, you know, years and years. I've been involved since season one. I think this is their 14th year um, going. And so that, I mean, the fact that I, I don't know how much luckier I could be than to have a show that goes on that long and incorporates all of the things that I do with my horses and they've written some of the yearly scripts to kind of tie in with some of the stuff that I've been doing with my horses or, um, but it's just been the longevity of the show, I think has been the biggest blessing and the people that I've met through it have been, you know, I've made some really good friendships with people, um, that work on it. Um, Amber in particular and I have stayed, become and stayed good friends and um, have a real great respect for one another. And that's been fun. Um, and I don't know, just, yeah, it's just fun to, to come up with different things and meet the challenges that that show has, has brought on. And, and uh, to see the success of the show has been really fun because I've kind of been there from, from year one when everybody, you know, nobody knew if it would keep going and had no idea it would turn into the, you know, brilliant success of a show that it is now so it's been it's been really fun to be a part of that fantastic so the next thing i wanted to ask you about is how to the horse so that is definitely on my bucket list obviously yes. um. <laughs> no it is so on my bucket list um so sadly last year it was cancelled because of covid but um so could you tell us a little bit about what it is and how did you come up with the idea and how on earth did you put it all together because it looked incredible um well, I, the only reason I put it all together was because of our mutual friend, Kim, who um, <laughs> Kim came into my life at just the perfect time. And she's such an incredible friend and human and horsewoman. And um, I had come up with this idea. I was always had it in the back of my mind that I wanted to produce. Um, I've been involved in um, event production for a very long time. Um, I've produced the openings at the Canadian Finals Rodeo for almost, in one way, shape, or form, almost 20 years now. Um, and that stemmed from my dad's work there, and I kind of took it over um, from him. And, and that event production led me to wanting to kind of bring all of the things that I loved about horses and the horse world together into one event and I wanted to use what I knew from the entertainment world and the educational aspect and ultimately I wanted the event to show how how much horses can inspire people and I mean you and I know what incredible animals they are and what they've done in our lives mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people know that feeling it's hard to explain that feeling um, but I wanted to explain that feeling I wanted people to understand what horses can bring to people and i wanted to do it in a way that 
was exciting and fun to watch and that entertained people where they could learn something and be so excited to get out there and work with their horses. Or if they, if they didn't have a horse to just be entertained by and inspired by other people's journeys and just enjoy, enjoy that aspect of it. Um, and I just, I wanted it to be fun and I wanted to bring people together and have a trade show experience and clinics and, we did a big night show entertainment um, feature on the Saturday night that was just like actually kind of surpassed all of my expectations for what we could put together. It was just incredible grouping of different disciplines that um, performers, we, we did about an hour long show and we had everything from trick riders to dressage to cutters to um, Liberty work to, you know, it was, it was just such a cool group of people that came together and just created this whole story of the horse and a show. And it was really, it was fun. It does sound amazing. Can you, um, for next year, in case I can't make it, could you do a live stream, please? So we can buy <laughs> well, a live stream ticket. We're working on some fun things. For Very good. Uh, and I could watch it from my lounge. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we're we're working on it. I will say, we're working hard to make some things happen. So I hope that we'll be able to do that. Brilliant. Right. So my next question: How on earth do you balance work, horses, and being a mum? Because I can see one of the little boys running around behind you, and you're clearly a force of nature. I would. I'm desperate to know the secret. Please. Well, it's so <laughs> my husband. Right. He, he. I'm number one. I really uh, have like the best husband in the world. He just. Came lunch he's been working hard all morning feeding animals and um just one sec honey uh, yeah my six-year-old is asking for help with school work right now we're home here um so one second hun i say that a lot one second <laughs> um, <laughs> dustin's incredible he will help with the kids so much so that i can pursue the things that are important to me and he's a wonderful dad and we really are just a team with everything we help each other so that we can live our lives in the way that really is meaningful to us and we both pursue our dreams and we just we're like-minded in the way that we just do whatever it takes to make um all of this happen and our kids are incredible they the two oldest ones so i have three boys um ridge is nine shade six and case is two and the two older boys have traveled since the time they were babies with me and they are just the coolest kids they know how to roll with it they um they help mommy they love um being a part of what we do and they love um you know w watching mommy work with the horses or helping my six-year-old comes out and helps me train horses um, oh. when i need to he will um you know, whatever it takes. And of course, the two year old now we're in a, you know, these are some challenging years with that age is, it's a challenge. We, you know, when you're working horses and case goes in the backpack a lot, if one of us has to put him in the backpack to get jobs done, and he loves it, he's happy to just go along. And um, I don't know that we if anybody ever thinks that they balance case it wants all. to go outside. <laughs> yes, <laughs> go outside. <laughs> I don't think we do it perfectly or greatly. Just try to get it done. And and I don't know, it's always a balancing act. And sometimes you feel like, man, I am not doing a good job of this. And other days I think, oh, we're doing all right. You know, this is working pretty good. So oh, I'm glad everybody feels like that. Because particularly yeah. with COVID when we're stuck, stuck in and we're hopefully out of lockdown soon. The Prime Minister yeah. spoke today, but we've... Uh, been in lockdown for a while and homeschooling and you, like you say you think oh I'm doing a rubbish job <laughs> no. I mean it's a challenging time and I think when you have little kids it I mean for us having them home and us being home more actually we are we've really enjoyed it um it's hard because it's not our choice to you know to <laughs> forced to have all these events and everything canceled so that's challenging but as far as actually being home together we've tried to make the most of that and we are enjoying that and um it's it's been really fun to have the kids and to be you know on a place where we can run around and be with the horses and on the ranch has been really good for us 
Um, so what would you say the most important thing is you've learned through your journey with horses and our liberty training? Um, I think the most... Hmm, I think probably... I, that answer would change all the time for me, like pr probably change on the daily. But today I'm going to say to never quit learning. Like Liberty Horse Training is so good because it's not something, it's not like something where you think, oh, I've kind of got the hang of this and I'll just coast for a while. Like they always keep you on your toes and you always need to learn new things and keep trying things and learning things and trying to be better for your horses. And I think that's the biggest thing I've learned is to, try to be happy with where you're at and be you know um appreciate where you and your horse are at but never quit learning and always kind of try to keep pushing the boundaries of what you can do and what you can accomplish but at the same time don't like like be happy with where you're at be proud of where you're at and know that every stage of things has a has a reason and has a you know <laughs> Kim and I were actually talking the other day about horses kind of act going through that acting up stage and like I used to get so stressed out when my horses were not working properly and and one of the best things I learned is like that's the best thing that can happen and I always kind of call it the toddler stage where it's like they almost act out a little just to see you know and once you get through that you're so much better off and you're so much more solid that I think yeah, you just have to look at the whole journey as like it's going to be a little bit of up and down and learning and you just have to appreciate all of it. Yeah, without taking it personal, I think. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Brilliant. So what's the best compliment you've ever received? Uh, well, I think, I, you know, as a mom, probably the thing that makes me the most proud is when people say like you know that my kids are you know nice kids or that they're um well behaved or which of that doesn't happen all the time but um or that you know that I'm doing a good thing as a mom or being a good mom or to me really at this stage of my life that's probably what's most important to me the best compliment that I could have is just having good kids good happy healthy kids and it's nice when you know people see that. Oh, lovely. So I think we might have already answered this, but what frustrates you most when training, and how do you deal with it? Sorry, what? What frustrates you most when training, and how do you deal with it? Oh, I think when I feel like I'm not getting across what I need to be getting across in an effective way, and I do get frustrated with myself, which always translates into frustration um, with the horses, which I have to work so hard at, like, managing and not getting frustrated at them, right, and, th and going back to saying, how can I like communicate this better or clearer or make it easier for them and I get frustrated because I I can't always think of how to do that what I find is if I just find some way to quit on a positive even if I have to go back to just basics find a positive way take a break go do something else that I know will put me in a better frame of mind for a while and then go back to it I have way better success with that mm -hmm. um, than trying to just get really and with that being said, there's times when you have to work through the hard stuff and you just have to when you're out in that training pen. But, um, yeah, I do get, you know, everybody gets frustrated at times and it's just from, I think, lack of not always knowing what, what to do. Yeah, well, if you feel like that, there's hope for all of us then, isn't there? <laughs> oh, I like that a lot. Trust me. I don't, yeah, I think, um. You know, the more it's like the old saying goes: the more you learn, the more you realize you don't, you know, you don't know that much. So, yeah, that's right. That's um, so do you have any practical tips or advice for people that are just starting out? Um. Well, I think just you know, learn as much as you can. I think it is helpful to have like one solid mentor that, so you don't get so overwhelmed. Like I'm the type of person that I love to just look at how everybody's doing everything and then just find 
works for me. But I think when you're starting out, that can be a little bit overwhelming. And sometimes it's easy is to just find one good person to kind of help you along. And as you get more comfortable and confident, you can kind of seek other teachers and books and videos and this and that. But I find, especially when I was starting, if I tried to learn everything from everybody, it was just very overwhelming. And then the other thing that I think is really important is horses are so forgiving and um, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Everybody's going to make mistakes when you're starting and that's how you learn. Don't feel like you have to be perfect and know everything to just go out and get started with your horse and you'll grow together and you'll learn together and they're not going to be perfect and you're not going to be perfect, but you, that's, that's how you will learn the best is get out there and give it a go. And you know, obviously do your homework and try to set yourself up for success. But I think if we wait until we think we're going to be perfect to start, it's really hard to ever get going, you know. Or we'll wait until you're perfect on the halter before you take it off. And then it's <laughs> still six months down the line still. That's right. Just get going. Just yeah. get trying it and learning. And, and then as you go, you'll figure it out. So lastly then, what are your goals for 2021? Um, my goals are to, get, well, I'm working on some really cool things with Heart of the Horse. And my, probably my biggest career goal is to see that to fruition. Um, we're working um, towards getting it on television and doing some online things with it. And just figuring out how to make an event possible right now is um, really hard because nobody knows what's what it's look like come even summer or fall mm -hmm. um so that's my kind of biggest career priority the live shows have been very slow obviously um i am doing some movie work and doing some training i have a show coming up next week and um and then i'm hopeful to have a busy summer doing some movies and and television stuff and um, I'm training a couple new horses right now. I have some good goals set for them. Um, and then just, you know, my boys are at a really fun, good age to just really do some cool things with them and teach them some stuff. So I have lots of, lots of plans and goals for the year. And so we're just, we're ready. Oh, it sounds amazing. Well, I can't wait to watch and see what happens with Heart of the Horse, but I've just remembered, I've forgotten to ask you my big question that I ask everybody. So this is the biggie. How do you believe in yourself and your horses? Um, how do I believe? Oh, gosh, that is a really good question. Um, I think everybody has those moments and days where you just, you do kind of feel that doubt creep in or you let yourself get a little bit down on yourself or your horses. And I, I read a lot of good books. I have a really good, um, a really good husband that helps pick me up when I need that. Um, I think it's important to have somebody in your life that when you're going through those hard days that say like, no, get out there. Like you can do it. Like just pick yourself up, you know? And then I do think it's important to try to grow as a person and read the books on how to um, be, find that confidence and that faith and that belief and whatever you need to do in your own journey to keep that is really important. Yeah. Oh, well, have you got any, one last thing, any particular books that you'd recommend on that then? <laughs> There's my other guy. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say hi? Hello. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. <laughs> um, really good books. Well, um, there's an interesting book I just started called Human in Training. It's a very good book. Um, I I continuously go back to Rachel Hollis's stuff. I like her books. Um, um, what's the actual title of the badass book that everybody knows about um yeah yeah, yeah something like that it's uh, I back to it all the time just because it does it really picks you up and makes you know that you know you got to put the work in mentally and i think that's a huge part of horse training is putting the work in physically mentally emotionally and getting yourself to a level where you're capable of being where your horses need you to be because it's not just being able to work them physically it's being able to get a hold of yourself emotionally 
mentally be in the headspace you need to be in. And, and it's an ongoing, it's a ongoing thing, I think for everybody, some people, it comes really easy to other people, I think have to really work at it, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a journey for sure. Well, thank you so much for joining us. You've given me lots to think about. And it's been lovely to meet you boys, <laughs> making a little appearance. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's been such an honor and a pleasure to get to talk to you. And Well, best of luck for 2021. And I hope um, everything comes to fruition. And uh, hopefully I'll get over there in person one day to come and watch. <laughs> we love that, Louise. And thank you so much for the chance to talk to you. Brilliant. You take care. See you later. Okay. Bye. bye. <laughs>